today I've got with me Michelle Bodine in Tri-Cities, Washington, and I'm excited to chat with her and get her take on first-time home buyers and some of the things that they really should want to know. And I know that when I was a first-time home buyer, I, I kind of didn't really have a hat rack to put any information on, so to speak. And so uh, if I was a first-time home buyer, I think we're going to go over some of the things that that they should know and they should want to know. They may not know that they want to know these things yet, but... Things you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's right. So, um, so with that, I think what I'd like to start with is um, what would you, Michelle, if you're meeting with a first-time home buyer for the first time, what would you ask them? What would I ask them? So I have a pretty streamlined process of checklist. You know, why are you moving here? What is it you need? Where do you want to be? Um, there's a lot of different questions there. Is there, what are your needs in a home? What do you, what do you need that home to do for you? Are you working in your home? Do you need your home to be close to an office? Do you have kids at home that need play space outside, indoor? Um, do you have health issues? Do you want a home that has no stairs, um, ADA access, no curb front door? So there's there's lots of little things like that that a lot of people don't even think about. They're just like, oh, I need a house. I'm going to need three bedrooms. And that may be great. You may need the three bedrooms. After our conversation, you may realize you need four. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a little bit of the who, what, where, and why of why you're even finding a house. What what are you changing? Where are you at now? What's wrong with it? Mm, that's great. I, I think, yeah, especially if somebody's doing any working from home and they have pets, children, what have you, um, that extra bedroom is really helpful. Ideal, yeah. And I think we are in such a transient isn't quite the right word. What's the right word? Um, a shift in the family system. I think over the last decade, a lot of families are, you know, you may have three teenagers, but you're like, ah, those two can share a room because they're all moving away. Hmm. One of them's probably not moving away. <laughs> I see. Or maybe grandma or grandpa's moving back in in the next three to five years. It's so I, a lot of multi-gen family situations. So having that flexible space, whether it's a family room that can convert to a guest room or something, is hmm. definitely become more of a priority than most people realize until they're desperately needing it. Nice, nice. And then after you get through with kind of sifting through those kind of questions, I suspect there's another question that comes up and another discussion. Yes, yes. What would that you know, be? The, uh, the, the big question is always how much? How much do you want to spend? How much can you spend? And has anyone approved that? <laughs> mm, that would be helpful. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you just looking at your monthly bills and going, eh, I want to spend, I want a monthly payment of 1500 a month. I can get a big house for that, right? Probably not. Um, but have you talked with a lender? Are you pre-approved? As in, have you submitted all of your pay stubs? Have they figured out exactly what you can afford, what your credit score, al credit score allows? what type of lending you qualify for, because that's all going to give us a big picture. You know, maybe you have an extra 3000 a month in your budget, but maybe your credit history isn't that great. And so your loan isn't going to allow you to have a payment that high or a loan for a house that big. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's, it's a little give and take on what you're really qualified for and and then there's a little bit of understanding the difference in the loan types. Conventional, you can pretty much buy whatever you want. FHA, you got to be a little more careful. And <laughs> yeah, and I guess if if someone's is not has not spoken with a lender and they come to you, that's not a bad thing, really. Right. Why is that? Because we and Tom and I both have some really great connections to amazing lenders and each of them have different programs, VA programs or FHA or first time buyers or 
all of those different things that you could qualify for. Um, and definitely we know, you know, if you're looking at a manufactured home in a park, that's going to be a different lender than the big fancy house on the hill. It's, they're gonna be different lenders and what your needs are may fit better with one or the other. Very good, yeah. And, and being licensed agents, the state likes us to share the names of three lenders. So we'll do three, or if you want more, we'll do more. Um, however, you want to be real careful, though, to tell the until you've talked with the lenders and you've figured out who you're going with, not to have them pull your credit, because they might all start pulling your credit and thinking, oh, they're the one, and then it'll take your scores down. Right. So, and then I think, if uh, Michelle, if I was coming to Tri-Cities and you were my agent, uh, and uh, let's say I was even a, a first-time home buyer, I, I might say, okay, yeah, give me your three. I, you know, that's great. But which one would you use if you were in my situation after having gone through all those questions that you asked me? Right. Um, and maybe some of those questions might get into finances a little bit. Like, we're not super interested in your finances because it's just not our thing. But we need to know a little bit so we know which way, if we right. zig, we zag. Right? Guide you the right direction. Exactly. So so it's 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 reasonable for me to say, well, okay, thanks for the three. I'll call them all, or maybe I won't. Which one would you use if you were me? Like, that's a fair question, isn't it? Right. I actually, so on one of my handouts, I have, um, I think it's five, might be six lenders listed. Mm -hmm. And then on two or three of them, I have a specific little note. You know, this one specializes in VA loans. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. And so definitely I would, I tend to usually give you a list of five or six and then guide you towards the two that might be the most likely fit. Very good. Very good. That's great. And now once you've gotten through that whole discussion about getting a pre-approval and, and, and what that means and all that, um, what's the next step? Uh, like, do we go look at homes right away or do you set something up on a computer or how does that work? Right. So um, I know Zillow is a big thing. Everybody goes to Zillow and does their little search and gets their little alerts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and do that if you must. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have buyers constantly send me screenshots of, oh, I saw this one on Zillow. Mm -hmm. It's already sold. Right. Um, or it's already, you know, they're in the inspection phase. It's at least under contract. Um, yep. Zillow is not always as up to date as we think it might be. Mm -hmm. um, I will then usually go into, I've got two different systems I can go into and set up a, an alert. So it will send you an alert for the four bedroom, three bath, 2,500 square foot house with a pool that you've asked for. And you will get all the new listings of anything that comes on that matches that criteria that we talked about. Now, can you, can you set that so that it comes to me just once a day? Cause like I'm busy. I don't want to be distracted throughout the day. Or conversely, could you set up so they come out immediately so I don't miss something? Absolutely. So I can have it as soon as it shows up in the system. I can have it as much as like once a week. Um, I, I have a few people that I set it up for, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Hmm. I can be very specific and I can even set the time. If you're like, I'm a day sleeper, I work nights. Hmm. I, I want to see those houses at five o'clock when I get up to go to work. Absolutely. 5 p.m. You're going to get your alerts. That's nice. That's yeah. nice. And it's yeah, all the yeah. active, active, actually available stuff. And yes. I don't know, because for me, so I'm in Ohio, right? So I don't handle rentals. So I took those out of my website. I don't, I just don't want them ever to show up for anybody because I just don't handle them. Um, so, you, you know, so basically everything that I'm sending out based on the search criteria that, you know, we figured out is potentially a winner so right. and 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 so so we're saving time we're not like oh let me go check zillow only check realtor.com let me check this let me check that everything that's in the mls is in our site and you know that's you know it's one of the things we we pay men, money for like good money right. for, to help our clients because we are providing service and we want to make it high value and that is one of the things we can do for it right? i do want to clarify sometimes we can't um, select some of the criteria that you might want in your True. window. Good point. So you don't want to be on a busy street. That's not a box we can check. So I tend to 
keep those listings dropping in your email. And then once or twice a week, depending on how active you're, you know, if you're ready to go right now, then I will check it once a day mm-hmm. and skim through and then email you back and say, hey, these two are prime. The other ones are garbage. They're on the wrong streets. Yeah. And cool. and make sure that that's kind of screened. And if you're screening those emails as they're coming through and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the one. Let me go see it. Absolutely. Hit reply yeah. to that email and, and let's get it set. Very good. Now, let's say, uh, you know, I, I see three or four that I think, wow, these are, these could be winners. Uh, what's the process like then? So then we, we work on getting appointments scheduled. Mm-hmm. Most houses, majority of houses, there are people living in the house. We can't just show up at the door and walk in. Um, every once in a while, we get those vacant ones. And I love that because I really can just go show it right now. But right. otherwise, we have to schedule. And I'm a little meticulous about you know, I'm not going to zigzag back and forth and cross the bridges 17 times. We're going to, we're going to make a loop. That's, or yeah. we're going to hit the house in Kennewick today and the house is in Pasco tomorrow. And yeah. we're going to break it down. Um, I try to keep it to four or five houses. Six is kind of my max. I know yours is four. And you like to keep it a little smaller. Um, we should tell people why. <laughs> yes, because you, you, they start blending together. You get to the sixth house and you're like, what was that house? I don't remember which one was which. Um, I do have, again, I'm I'm a big believer in checklists and charts and paperwork, too much paperwork. Yeah. Um, but I have a cute little clipboard and a little chart and it has the address of the house, the price, the square footage, how many bedrooms. So it's got all the basics. Um, usually I have the buyers nickname the house. We pull up and they're like, oh, it's the window house or it's the blue house. And So we nickname the house and then it has plus and uh, like thumbs up, thumbs down little images on it. And so the kitchen was garbage, but the bedrooms were amazing. And so they can make notes. And then at the end of that tour, that day's tour, we can go through and say, okay, I have my printouts that have all the backside detail of all the dirty secrets of this house. And they have their little clipboard. Uh And then we compare notes at the last house. Which ones are we crossing off? Which ones are garbage? Yeah. Which ones do we really, really love? That's great. And then if we're doing two or three days of showings, then we can, you know, that second day, we can compare notes again. Okay, was this one higher than the last one yesterday? Mm-hmm. Where are we at? That's excellent. You know, I'm kind of, I'm reminded of this study and I, I, I don't know, probably somebody probably got paid millions of dollars to do this, this, this study. <laughs> That's the way the world works these days. But it, it was a study, they, they wanted to see how high can crows count to? And it turns out they can count to seven. So if 15 people run into a cornfield, they fly out and they sit on the fence and they wait till the seventh one comes out. At, upon the seventh one departing, they fly back in, not really realizing that they couldn't count very good because there's eight more. So when it comes to houses, I have found uh, over and over and over again, the force, the max. Now, you might be able to get by with that if let's say you have an MLS printout sheet and you crumple it up. You're like, this house is not for me and throw it away. And that way you just don't have to forget about it. But I love what Michelle's doing. Like she's so organized. Like that's fantastic. Um, That's really, really good. That's, that's brilliant. Michelle, that's really good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little simpler. It's just crumple it up and we're done with that house. Let's move on. I don't know. It doesn't have to occupy any space in my brain from then on. (laughs) I, but, I have a trash bag in my car. So as I get back in the car, sometimes they get pulled from the clipboard and thrown over the seat. And nice. That's, <laughs> yes. yeah, that's the extent of my basketball practices. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, that's great. And uh, now, okay, let's say, you know, upon the review of the house, you're like, they're like, we love this house. Or let's say that you go into a house and all of a sudden the demeanor of your clients changes quite a bit. Because they're really chewing on this house, like, hmm, this, mm-hmm. okay, I can put, fit the couch there. This works, that works. Right. Hmm. Is there a question you might ask them at that point? Like, would you like to write an offer on this house, or right. could you right. see yourself living here? Yeah. That's that's about as pushy as either Michelle or I get. It's just like, okay, well, obviously this this fits, right? My and, my question is usually, would you be sad if you found out tomorrow that somebody else bought the house? Mm, that's a good way to put it yeah 
you know, because that that is, that does speak to our motivations and it, it gets right to the point. It's like, ah, yeah. Yeah, I really would. I want this house. Right. Okay, well, then let's go write an offer, right? Yep. Okay. And due to our amazing technology that we both have access to, I don't yeah. know how much you use this. I seriously do. Um, I can write an offer on my phone. I have stood in a living room at a house and written an offer. Nice. And we've got, you know, again, those preset templates and things like that. We're both pretty tech savvy with that and having things already pre-written. And so it's pretty easy to just drop in the info and I can, I can literally, I've written three offers in, in kitchens. That's fabulous. I love that. That's great, Michelle. I, uh, um, <clears throat> my, I had a cousin that used to say high speed, low drag at times like this. That's, that's, <laughs> that's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. Now, maybe we should talk a little bit about some of the mechanics of an offer. Like, I mean, if I was a buyer and it was first time home buyer, I, I guess I would want to know, like, okay, what exactly, what decisions do I have to make and how do they impact me? Right. Um, so usually if, see, so for example, um, showed a bunch of houses to a client last weekend. Mm -hmm. We did, you know, three days of tours. We did one day in this town and one day in that town. Mm -hmm. and then narrowed it down mm -hmm. um and then they chewed on it mm -hmm. for five days <laughs> mm -hmm. really gonna digest it it was it was super hard for me because i'm like i know it's the house like and i already had like some of the paperwork already start i'm like i know it's the house this is the house wow. and it just took them a day to like make sure they were really thorough and i <laughs> i'm okay with that you got to make sure i don't want to make you i don't want to push you into something that in a month you're going to regret yeah um but so then once they're like, okay, this is it. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. So then I sent them a little list. So I will need your contact info, full address, everything. If I don't already have that, which usually I already do, um, how much you want to write the offer for. And so that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. Has the house been on the market for three months? This mm -hmm. one had. Okay. So we, we had a little wiggle room on the price because they mm -hmm. hadn't changed it yet. So we're like, okay, it's been sitting for three months. Let's, let's offer a little low. Mm -hmm. um, do they need closing costs paid? They mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. That's dependent on the market. Right now, there's a little bit of opportunity for that, but not a lot. And we got lucky. Mm -hmm. And that was the seller said yes. Mm -hmm. um, the price, closing costs, um, earnest money which earnest money has to be paid within three days of acceptance of the offer. Mm -hmm. And so how much money are you going to put up front on the table to say, this is really, I really want this. I'm not going to walk away. Because mm -hmm. if you walk away just because you saw something else shiny, you've lost that earnest money. Mm -hmm. But if you walk away because you found out the whole basement's full of mold, yep. you get your earnest money back. <laughs> if there's yeah, no I, I, and I should interject real quick. So that's Washington, Ohio, yeah. Ohio. Uh, I, I wish they would adopt that approach because over here, what I finally decided to do is until we're satisfied on the inspection and everything's gone good, we're not even, we're not even obligated to put in our earnest money. So basically I'm given three days to put in earnest money because in Ohio, if Let's say, okay, inspection, yeah, the, how, something's, you know, a wall's full of mold and somehow we figured that out or attic's full of mold and that, uh, under no circumstances does the buyer in, in, want to proceed. Let's just say that's the case. I mean, you can remediate, okay? There is a way mm -hmm. to get through that and, and, and it's fine. There is a way, literally, there is, there really is a way. But let's say the buyer wants to get out. In Ohio, both parties have to sign off on a mutual rescission so that the buyer can get their earnest money out of escrow. Yeah. Or they have to wait two years. And I just went through this process. So it does happen, okay, uh, where it gets locked up and the seller is just not willing to sign it for some reason, you know. And um, and so then, uh, so then, so we went to two years. We're like, okay, time's up. Like, send them the money, please. Like, I've been on this thing, right? Uh and then finally, they got the seller to sign it. So they still wouldn't release it without the seller's signature, which is like, I, wow. So I, I know we have a rescission form now, hmm. but I don't know how, because of the way the contract's written, I think they can still release it without 
Mm. That's fine. Yeah. So what I've done is I've, you know, put it in my contract that earnest money is not due until within three days after successful, you know, negotiation of inspection contingency, something to that effect. Mm. And uh, because I do not want to deal with that again. So, and I mean, and the the thing is like, you know, somebody listening to us might be thinking, well, it's not fun for you, Tom. Like, what about the buyer? It's, it's their money. No, no, you don't understand. I feel it. Okay. As if it was my money times about 10, because it's your money (laughs) and it's my job, (laughs) you know? And so, yeah, so that's why I just came to the conclusion. I'm just, I'm not playing that game anymore. So you know now of course in a market where it's really tight like what i'm dealing with in ohio nah, you know you gotta you gotta pick your pick which deals you're gonna go after because we still have 10 offers on some houses right now and going with that approach i'm saying it's, you're not going to get the deal but right. it's probably going to go to a cash buyer anyway so who cares <laughs> you know like, <laughs> so so for that reason like you're giving the example of hey the house is on the market three months perfect because they'll negotiate with you. Yeah. So that's yeah. you know the key there. Which also is is a reason to have to interview a few agents before you even start looking. Talk to some agents, figure out what their system is, what their protocol, how well they know the paperwork mm-hmm. and what they can what they can go to bat for you on. Um, because if they've never had the experience, if they have no idea if they're, I mean. New agents can be so on top of it and super smart if they've they've actually done the homework. And so definitely not, it has nothing to do with whether you're new or an, an experienced agent. It literally has nothing to do with that. It's it's very much how active and interactive you are with that paperwork. Yeah. And I would say too, like for me, the biggest thing, the biggest thing I want out of an agent is that they're honest. Like you know everything else is kind of workable and of course you know i'm a realtor so like i already know i already know the drill right but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day if i don't have that honesty like i don't have anything i would rather i mean i'd rather blindfold myself and do the transaction without their help (laughs) you know i mean but you know i am an agent so like okay like i'm I'm not saying oh if i wasn't an agent i'm saying oh i am an agent i've been an agent 14 years yeah i'm just saying that an honest agent is like, is worth their weight in gold. But that's the case for any profession, I think, you know. Right, right. And someone who's going to go to bat for you and not just for their commission. Yeah, right. That's, that's the balance. Um, and sure. unfortunately, that's not always the case. And that's disappointing. <laughs> but not always the case. I think I can try to see is you got a lot of great agents. Yes. You really yes, do. do. Yeah, a lot of great agents. Um, so, okay. So, then let's say you draft the offer, you review it, right? And then what's the process from there? Um, so usually the offer has an expiration date. It's good for yeah. about 48 hours, usually two to three days. Okay. Um, sellers have a chance, so it gets, I send a cute little list of details of what that offer includes. And I put it in an email and send it to the other agent and they share it with the seller. And maybe you're the only one they're sharing. Maybe it's one of five depends on the system or the, the day of the week. Um, and so then the sellers have a chance to negotiate back. Do you make it a counteroffer? You know, maybe they want a little more down payment or earnest money, or maybe they want a different title company. Um, lots of different things that they can negotiate on that specific offer. Um, closing dates, price, earnest money, timeline, Oh, that's the closing date. Um, inspection time frame. I've had them negotiate that before. Usually that's about a week. Um, I've had somebody come back at five days, not seven. Um, but most most of those things are a little, you know, it's a day or two here and there. It's a little tweak. And usually we can come up with something, meet in the middle somewhere. Um, and then once they've accepted, or countered. If they counter, then we sit and talk again and maybe respond, maybe agree, maybe counter back. Um, and once it's agreed to, then the time starts clicking. So then we've got so many days to get earnest money, so many days to get the inspection, and then everything else starts rolling until closing date. Very good, very good. And um, yeah, and maybe just to go rewind a little bit, 
So what are like the main factors that have to be chosen in the contract? Sales price, like offer price, let's say for mm -hmm. the buyer's side. Earnest money, you mentioned that. Money. Inspection days. Mm. Title company. Okay, which title company? And generally it's said that, whose choice is that? Um, it should be buyers. <laughs> should be. But I know I worked for a builder for many years. And if you wanted to do business with them, it was going to be his title company. And sometimes uh, the listing will specify, please use this title company. Yeah. Now, and sometimes for the most part, that's usually okay. Right. It, yeah. Well, and the reality is we got a lot of great title companies in yes. Tri-Cities too. So like, it's like really hard to go wrong. And yeah. you know, let's face it, people that are dotting their I's, crossing their T's like title companies do and, you know, kind of playing the role of Switzerland, well, at least Switzerland in the old days. Um because they're 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 not exactly impartial anymore, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, you know they they uh, you know th they're going to be good at that job, and like if they're not good at it, they're going to be out pretty quick. Right. Uh, so and they're not even going to want to do the job, to be honest with you. So they have to be pretty <laughs> good. At it. Um, yeah, and then so sometimes uh, the there may there might have been some work to do on the front end to get title clear, and so then it kind of only makes sense to go with that title company that already did that work because they're familiar with it. And the new title companies go, Oh, what's this? And well, it's already been resolved by the other title company, but they don't know right. that they got to start over. So, you know, and then in a case with a big, a builder, you know, he doesn't want to be going to 14 different title companies to sign stuff. He's got multiple things to sign and just wants to get it done quick. And you know, all the same. in every Friday and sign his paperwork. Yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. Now, you see any other terms that sometimes are special um, terms too. The optional clauses page gives you things. Um, I usually include a warranty for all of mine, whether I'm the listing agent or the buyer's agent. Um, and that's, that's where I fill that out. Um, it also says things like, you know, the sellers will have the house empty. They will take all their things out and they will do a basic cleaning. It's not going to be full of muck. Um, what if what if I want the hot tub? So those things are on the first page, very first page. Mm -hmm. um, it lists what appliances are staying, what um, any extra things. You know, if there's a a hot tub, a How about what, a swing a, set. What was that? A swing set. Right, right. Playground equipment, barbecues that are built in out back, the outdoor kitchen kind of things. Any of any of those extras, if there's like a shed that's movable and it's staying, mm -hmm. um, some trampolines, gosh, a couple other things like that. Yard, mostly, mostly it's appliances and outdoor things. Those are the two things they're usually mm -hmm. listed. That's great. I need to check on a fridge that's supposed to stay tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> all right now let's say you get through all that and you come to a mutual agreement and the clock starts ticking things are rolling so so what kind of happens first within the contract contract period um getting that inspection ordered again on that same sheet that i give all the list of lenders i have a list of inspectors and i list five or six on there um you need that inspection you know, day one, you need to start making phone calls and get that inspection ordered fast because you usually have about five to seven days to get the inspection completed and decide if there's anything you need repaired. Mm -hmm. And we need the paperwork filled out within that week. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you've got that ordered, getting earnest money deposited is usually the second step. Mm -hmm. And then after those two things are completed and we, we get to inspection phase, got an inspection this afternoon, um, if there's anything that's, wait, I had a bathtub faucet fall off in the inspector's hand last week. So that needs replaced. Um, wow. is it urgent? Is it life shattering? Is it millions of dollars? No. Sellers are offering a thousand dollars at closing and it's going towards a couple of shingles getting repaired and the faucet getting repaired and something else. But they were all little things. And so it's usually usually little things that, that come up. If there is something major, there is an opportunity, say, I had a house that the foundation was questionable. There was a crack 
It was visible on the southwest corner and the northeast corner. And he's like, does it go all the way through? And so we had to have an engineer come out. And so we had to, we had to request an extension for the inspection, request an extra three to five days, have a different inspector come out. He said, nope, you're all good. And we moved on. Cool. It could have been a $40,000 concrete slab replacement um but it wasn't um but those things are all negotiable so it it may mean sellers just make those repairs seller fixes that bathtub faucet and puts the straps on the water heater yeah. and we move on no yeah. money changes hands they just fix those things or yeah. it could be they give credit at closing and yeah. you fix the things after you've bought the house yeah um or they adjust the price they say you know you offered four hundred thousand. We'll knock it down to three ninety five, and you can deal with it later. Yeah, um, okay. depends on the urgency or the you know if the sellers are even still in town. Yeah, you know I think one of the things that's helpful, like let's just say this is pretend I'm a buyer and I you know I don't buy and sell all the time. So, you know, but what's helpful for me is I can actually ask the agent, well, is that normal? And if the agent has, yeah some years of experience they'll be able to say yes it's normal or right. it's it's a little bit on the edge of normal but it's still within the range it's it's you know each deal is different this one's got this wrinkle but everything else has been really standard you know right. or no it's really crazy <laughs> <laughs> and here's how i think we should handle it you know right right you know and then the other part too is um you know we've we do have a backstop in in the sense that you know if something is so crazy beyond let's say in my case 14 years experience i can go ask actually both michelle and i have access to really like eighty-seven thousand agents we could ask their opinion if we wanted to you know there's just there's various forms in our internet but we could always obviously go to our managing broker and say and which you know i've done that just recently on something mm -hmm. um hey what would you do in this case or you know so we have a good backstop and then if you think about it from a managing broker's perspective, like in the case of Ohio, our managing broker is actually overseeing like over 1500 agents. That's a lot of, you know, craziness that could happen because just so many deals, so many agents dealing with so many crazy people in some cases. Right. Um, and so there's lots of opportunity to, to, to see, you know, what crazy stuff comes up and the solutions too. So I think that's kind of a, a cool feature of having an agent too, because I mean, even if I'm an experienced buyer, I bought five houses. I mean, when I was in Tri-Cities, I was closing five to 12 a month towards the end there. So uh, like five houses in a life, like how does that compare to five or 12 a, a month, you know, or five or 12 in a whole mm -hmm. lifetime compared to five or 12 in, in, in a month? You know, it just, it doesn't compare. So the amount of experience is just vastly different, right? Right. Right. Um, and having those moments, um, having those examples to share. I mean, I, I had to yeah. talk, plan off the ledge recently and, and give an example of a similar, they were concerned a situation may happen. Right. It isn't happening. It hasn't happened, but they were concerned. Family had sure. expressed, you know, better be prepared. Yeah. And, and they're like, well, what if, but what if, but what if? Right. And and so I was able to share an example of a situation that did happen that was similar to what they were saying and yep. how I dealt with that. And I think that's something um, that you and I both have outside of real estate. We're, we're pretty quick to go to bat for people and right. anyway. Right. And and so knowing that your agent is willing to step up and yep. I mean I in that particular situation we had hidden water damage. Mm. I know, uh, I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was not a good situation. We had some dishonesty with the sellers, and we had some um, we had a really big struggle, and there was like six or eight grand in water damage. It was multi level in the home, and they had gifted the sofa so that it would cover it up and no one would notice. And you know, and they had parked a boat blocking damage in the garage so the inspector couldn't get to it when he inspected and so in that situation there was a lot of different things we could have done the buyers could have sued the seller 
could have gone straight to a lawsuit. Just they could have sued the law, the listing agent um, for culpability there. Um, forms were not filled out properly and paperwork was not processed as it should have been. And instead I had a chat. I didn't even use my managing broker. I I could have, but I I looped the other managing broker into the situation and said, here's what we're dealing with. How would you like to fix it? Very good. And yeah, you did a yeoman's people, job on that. Well, and most people would be, I was a newer agent. I was what, two years in, three years in as an agent. I'm only six years in now. So I think that was three years, something like I think, that. I think it really proved you cut your teeth there. Yeah, yeah. And, and this managing broker, this particular company is a big name in town. And a lot of people are a little hesitant to go toe to toe with them. And, and I was like, no, you, you messed up, fix it. <laughs> mm. And they did. They came in and they covered the costs and they got it all fixed. Um, well, to their credit too, because that that's you know yeah. that's, that's an amazing person and company. You yeah, know, really. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. But yeah, good job on that. Um, now, um, okay, so I'm curious on earnest money. Like, is there like a general rule of thumb that you're using for how much earnest money to put up? Um. Usually the more expensive the home, the larger the earnest money. Yeah. Um, I don't have like a specific, I tell buyers whatever they're comfortable with. Usually it's between 500 and 5,000. Mm -hmm. And if there's more offers, I would go higher. Okay. That's um, good. How much, how much invested you are in. I've had people put 10,000 or 20,000 down for earnest money, even if that was like, this is the house, I'm not losing this house. But it just, it, it lets the seller know that you're really in it. Because if something, you're not just going to back out for fun. Now, it's some, so I, I like extreme examples, but no, nobody's going to ask you to do this. I'm just sharing. <laughs> if you're <laughs> listening to me, whoever's listening to this in the future, nobody's going to ask you to do this. But I know somebody that was a very, 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 very savvy investor. And um, there was a piece of property he wanted for a very long time. It finally came available for sale. He immediately called on it, put an offer on it, and then um, and a good offer because he really wanted this property. And then the agent called him back and said, "I got another offer on it." And he's and so he, what he did was he made he put the whole amount that he was offering for the property in cash as earnest money. And, non oh and non refundable. And needless to say, he they closed with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He did not want to lose that property. So how important is earnest money? Well, I mean, if somebody that's super savvy, like, I mean, I'm talking like 30 years in the business, you know, investing, buying and selling themselves, you know, uh, if they would be willing to do something like that with their earnest money. Yeah, earnest money is serious. Now, do we normally that's extreme totally extreme right. that's the most extreme example i've ever heard of um so generally what i hear is like one percent is probably a, a good number so if the sales price is five hundred thousand let's make it five grand right yeah. um and but if there's a lot of competition like michelle said then you may want to sharpen your pencil because well, a seller is going to look at that pretty seriously like whoa yeah. Yes, that definitely has impact. That number is going to have impact. I know something as the market was a little more wild the last few years, um, one of the tricks we were doing, I was doing, um, was releasing the earnest money to the seller once the inspection was approved. Wow. So maybe we're only a week in to mm -hmm. our contract and we still got three weeks to go before we close. Mm -hmm. But now that seller has that five grand towards their moving costs. Mm -hmm. And well, and just to clarify, where does that earnest money go? So when I say deposit your earnest money and they're like, it's already in my bank. No. So usually that means you take a cashier's check or do a set up a money wire to mm -hmm. the title company. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go to the seller unless we've signed paperwork releasing it at some point. Right. Um, but it sits in in holding at the title company. 
And then when you actually close on the home, that 500 or 5,000 or whatever it was goes towards, it's credited towards your closing costs. Right. So yeah. if now you, you know that you've got 10 grand, you've got to pay for your down payment, but yeah. you've got five grand sitting there in holding, that's part of your down payment. That's right. That's very good. That's great. And uh, yeah, and also if you're doing a new construction purchase, you're probably going to have some non-refundable deposit. Mm -hmm. um, so now the thing is, you know, you, you want to vet the builder up front and all that kind of thing and, you know, have your agent, you know, walk with you through the process. And um, uh, there are a few places where your agent will be helpful. And just, again, knowing what's normal, you mm -hmm. know, because if you're working with a builder, that's a big fish, right? So hopefully you're dealing with a really reputable one. And but even a reputable one might they might have a bad day or maybe has an employee that has a bad day or a superintendent has a bad day or whatever. So having your agent there to guide you through, yeah, this is normal. Hey, oh, not quite. Let's not. No, no. Let's back that. Let's let's do this. You know, let's fix this. Um, mm -hmm. And and there's there are some great builders in Tri Cities too. Like um, so, oh, yeah. 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 I even had one where I mean, just kind of a transparency on my part. Um, I was, I wouldn't say I was a new agent. I wasn't, I was probably, man, I don't know, maybe halfway into my career, probably that's 14 years now. So maybe a little less, but, um, the buyer thought that he was getting a, um, a garage door opener and there wasn't one in, installed. So he wasn't getting one and we didn't talk about it. So it wasn't in the contract, but because, I had a good relationship with the, with this builder. Um, I said, would you guys be able to just go ahead and install one? And they did. They did. Nice. It was very nice. And actually, I should say that was a new tradition, homes. So just because, you know, I believe in giving credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, thank you very much, new tradition homes. I will gladly yeah. do this with you in the future. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Really took care of my client and me, you know, and my buyer was very happy, and so was I. Makes everybody look good. <laughs> for sure. No, it was super appreciated. Um, and for them, you know, they could do it at cost, but it still cost them. Right. So it was, oh, okay. it was pretty awesome of them to do that. So um, another note with the earnest money, um, yes. I get asked a lot, what if I change my mind? Ah, yes. What if I change my mind? What are my options? Um, or what if we get to the inspection and oh my gosh, the house is full of termites and it's rotting and it's going to fall down on me. Like, I don't want this house. Do right. they get to keep my earnest money? No. Um, so there's, there's checkpoints. You mm -hmm. have checkpoints. Um, part of the contract, you have three days to review the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If you find out there's a serial killer living next door, you can cancel your contract. You Thank know, you if you much. find out there's something really crazy or toxic waste dump or I don't know what crazy I haven't ever had anyone use that clause yet but yeah me neither just in case right you know it's your job I am going to try my hardest to inform you of what I do know mm -hmm. but I'm not familiar with every single school and every single neighbor and right. every single traffic zone I, I don't know it all but yeah. if if you discover in that three first three days after contract assigned that something funky is going on that you just can't live with you can back out and you can get your earnest money back mm -hmm. same with at the inspection and same with at the appraisal if the appraisal comes back and you've offered 450 and the house is only worth 400 you can you can say sorry this isn't going to work for me or you also have the chance to go back to the seller every point is a negotiating point yeah maybe that serial killer lives next door you had your three-day review, and maybe you're just going to negotiate building a concrete wall. Maybe that's good enough for you. <laughs> everything's negotiable. <laughs> right. Probably shouldn't be, but everything's negotiable. Yeah. Now let's talk about a low appraisal. So that's a pretty extreme example, 450 to 400. But um, so what? What other options? I mean, they could say goodbye. Right. They have that right, but because you know you would have been you know check that appraisal box yeah. or whatever contingency box um but what other options if, what if they're like really love the property and it's like it's perfect and it's like two doors down from mom and dad and that's like built-in babysitting and like right where we need to be yeah 
So there's a couple of steps. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's a matter of, I've, I've had an appraisal done on a home where the appraisal was delayed and it kept taking a little extra and I'm like, what's going on? And I finally, you know, my buyers were getting antsy and we're all kind of panicking, like, is this gonna sink our, our deal? Yeah. And the appraisal came back and she's like, well, I, I, I got it to appraise for the value, but I just, that was really, there's not really anything like that. It was really hard to match the price and find comparables. Their goal is to find other houses similar to yours for the same value. They've got to prove that it's worth that for the loan company. That's the, the point of the appraisal. And I'm looking through the appraisal and she had all the wrong stats for the house. The wrong square, less square footage, more bedrooms and impossible numbers. And that's why she couldn't find comparable homes. So sometimes it's a matter of the paperwork's funny. So that's the job. I don't always get a copy of the appraisal. So as if there are questions, that's a, that's that's my first request. Give me a copy. Let me figure out what's missing. What did we skip right. over? What did we do wrong? Yeah. Did somebody drop a box, a number in a, the wrong box. Right. Um, we just changed our state forms in the last two years. That it used to be if it came in low, it could automatically kill your deal. We had to specifically check boxes to say no, no, no. Please let us talk. Um, now there's a now it's in the paperwork. We can still talk automatically, um, but you have the choice of walking away, renegotiating the price, um, or taking it. So okay, it only pays for four hundred. I will pay the extra five fifty thousand out of pocket. My loan won't cover that. Um, so you can you can pay the difference. Um, a lot of times, usually, usually if the appraisal is different, it's just a couple thousand. I've seen like five to ten thousand, and usually you can either negotiate. You know, you bring a couple extra thousand, seller comes down a couple thousand, and we meet in the middle. Right, That's especially if it's cool. a hot market, because it's you know if it's a hot market, it's a good chance they put it back in the market and they sell it for the same amount or more. You know, yeah. now if the market's softening, well then that's a different matter. And then the appraiser is probably trying to cover, you know, themselves yeah. so to speak, because they don't want to be a part of a, you know, something that maybe down, down the, the road a little bit goes south and right. then you kind of get their neck in a federal noose. Um, well, and with the, the prices that were jumping so fast two years ago, um, it was really hard for appraisers for sure. because the prices were, I mean, the houses that closed two weeks ago were worth 20 grand less than the houses closing next week. And it was that big of a jump that it was like, are we even, can we match prices? Can we value? And so it was, it was a little bit of a struggle there for a minute when prices were kind of nice. Yeah. But. And just to be clear on, on the appraisals, appraiser's role, they're supposed to find comps and they're supposed to bracket the house. So something better, something worse. So something's probably going to appraise a little higher, something's appraised a little lower. And then one that's whatever in between there somewhere. And it's comparable and then and 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 basically it's supposed to be very impartial right very scientific if you will now is there still some art there yeah yeah there's a little bit of art there and i can give you one example i i, I did have an appraisal come back low and so like michelle was talking about i analyzed it and i came up with it was either seven or ten things that the appraiser made a mistake on including he missed a three-quarter bath it was kind of tucked away sort of so it's kind right. of understandable he could have missed it but just that three-quarter bath would at that in that market probably would have been maybe 6,500 bucks or something in that neighborhood mm -hmm. and so on so just that right there would have covered almost half of our difference you know so right. but and then there was you know whatever it was six or nine other things that were issues and um, you know so it, it helps to have an agent that that's going to, you know, that's going to be willing to go look at the details and not just go, ah, let's go on to the next house or whatever. Right. Right. Well, and whatever that appraiser comes back with, um, neither agent has communication with them. Typically ne they, they go in on their own. They check out the house at best. The listing agent schedules it. Um, buyer's agent rarely even knows when it's happening. So 
we don't have communication. I can't just give them a cute little packet and say, hey, this is our pretty house and it's fancy because like, make sure you get this price. We're not allowed to do that because we can't influence him, them, her. Um, but once it's back, um, once the buyer receives that, it's kind of a pass fail is the only information they have to tell the sellers. So for instance, I had a house come back above asking price. I just have to say, we passed appraisal. Right. Sellers don't need to know they could have made an extra 35 grand. Right. It would just and, make, their, make their, their day very miserable. Probably their weekend right. too. And right. they would probably look for an opportunity to get out of the deal if they could. So Exactly. And so it just means that buyer has, buyer has built an equity now. <clears throat> yep, exactly. Yep. Very good. So after, you know, inspections, appraisals, you're through all that. Uh, there's another word that sometimes comes up and sometimes buyers get to hear it. It starts with a U called underwriting. Mm -hmm. So now the thing is that people kind of understand, okay, yeah, they're underwriting the house, right? To see if they want to, you know, loan on this house, but they're also underwriting the buyer or buyers as the case may be. So now usually they've done, they've done some of that, and you know, up front, you, you could you could say, you know, checking your debt to income ratios and hopefully the things that they, the lender did before you, they gave you the pre-approval. So yeah. that's part of that process, but they're still, and they could even check, are you still employed? Um, and then oh, did you just all of a sudden obligate yourself to buying a $700 a month car and now your debt to income ratio is all messed up, you can't buy the house. So they're gonna check these things like potentially like, like literally the day before you close. So you want to, you know, I, I, some lenders have a sheet called the uh, 10 commandments uh, of, you know, buying a house, you know, as pertains to the lending side, don't go buy furniture before, before you close. Don't go buy a car before you close. Like if you want to do anything, just call me. Okay. okay. <laughs> because yes. Don't touch your credit. Yeah. Like yeah don't. Anything that's going to touch your credit while you're under contract. And so often, you know, we have buyers that get pre-approved and they get pre-approved and then they take a week or two to talk to, to talk to, to agents. And yeah. then they take a month or two to look at houses. And so we've got a pre-approval from January, but it's June that we're writing a contract. Yeah. And so, yeah, you were, you were good to go in January, but now they're pulling your credit that last week and going, well, you just took out three student loans and bought a new truck and you can't furnish the house before you have it. Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So the amazing thing is once you close, you can do whatever you want to do. Yes. Now, of course, you know, we would always um, advise being very, you know. Um, Still be smart about your decisions. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, over, you know, don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't stretch uh, your, your, yourself bit beyond your budget means, right? Yeah. We want you to keep the house. We want you to be happy. Right. You know, uh, and uh, so now uh, after it gets through all the underwriting, then there's something called a clear to close. Now, who issues that? The lender does, correct? Right. Yeah. So they're going to send. Yeah. So they're going to send documents to escrow, which, you know, your agent's going to open escrow like the first day you go under contract. Like that's like the first thing they do. Boom. They send the the purchase the uh, the agreed upon purchase and sale agreement you know fully executed is what they call it in, in the sense that everybody signed, and any changes have been initialed, and um, and sent that over to the escrow officer, and it, and sometimes it might have to get assigned to an escrow officer. Sometimes you already know who that is, and um, and then and then from there they get the documents, and then the escrow officer can prepare closing documents. And that's what the buyer gets to sign and the seller gets, you know, to sign their, their side too. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then usually close either same day or maybe the next day. And once it's, you know, filed with the County, um, then they give you oh, your the new keys. keys. Yeah. So the house is yours. And um, now sometimes there's uh, little wrinkles. In fact, that could be part of a negotiation too. Like, let's say, let's say you got, uh, sellers that, you know, maybe they got disabilities or can't move that fast or they're older or we have health situations. So they, or maybe they need, they need to actually make sure it closes so the money's in the bank and, and then they'll hire the movers and get out. So they might want five, 10 days extra to get out. 
Now, so that's something that's, and, and here's the thing, you know, so it's, it's in the basket of things that are not necessarily d directly cash, like in other words, not offer price, but to the seller, that might be really, really important. You know, like so I had a really elderly seller and it was really important. We, we take our gentle, careful time with him, not stress him out. He had a very weak heart. He was like 92. Um, and so we just gave him 10 days to, to get out, you know, and that was actually, I was actually buying his house, matter of fact. And um, so we had to take, to take care of him very gingerly, very, very special man, very wonderful man. Very want to take really good care of him. And, you know, um, it's good to give people what they want if it doesn't hurt you, you yeah. know, and it's all part of the negotiation. It's all fair. Like you could like your agent, let, let's say it's Michelle, you can ask the agent, hey, what's important to the seller that's not necessarily just dollars and cents? Mm -hmm. And they might say, oh, well, it's this or it's that. And, you know, then right. it's, it's, it's good information and it's, you know trying to create a win-win really, you know, um, obviously we want to get to the best price you can, but it's not all about the price and, and we may be able to keep the price lower, but give them something else. that's actually a little bit more important than that number. So right. and well, and sometimes the closing date is a, is a stickler because maybe, maybe they're buying a house someplace else and they need to close on that day. They need the money from selling to mm -hmm. close. So, right. It's it's always kind of a backwards domino effect. Yeah, you got to work it backwards, right? We've got the buyers close first, yeah, so that then the sellers can buy their next house, but the sellers can't get out until they've got the keys, so right. the new buyers can't get in, and so we have this little staggering effect that happens a lot of times. Um, I'm, right. I'm doing that and tomorrow. I We're yeah. juggling timelines to get people out of a house so we can get people yeah. into the house and. Yeah, I always like to, you know, keep in mind, you know, it's it's not, yes, like, I, if I'm representing the buyer, I'm representing the buyer, but it's good for me to understand what's going on in the seller's mind. Mm -hmm. They're stressed. Are the buyers going to be able to close? Because it does happen. You've seen houses, they were under contract, and then they pop back on the market. Well, what happened? Well, it could have been the inspection, or it could have been later on during the appraisal, or it could have been during some kind of underwriting issue that came up or the buyers might have gone out and bought furniture <laughs> and now they can't close right. you know so the seller doesn't know it's closing until it's closed for sure right. and so you can imagine why they would in some cases want to have maybe five days post closing or 10 days especially if they're moving across the country you know so just something to keep in mind um yeah. you know ideally we like to get get possession immediately but it could be a negotiation item that doesn't necessarily cost you a whole lot more, especially if you're renting right now, because you're a first time home buyer, that's really what mm -hmm. we're talking about mostly right yeah. now, right? Then it's not gonna hurt you. If you've got, you've got the apartment for 10 more days anyways, ah, let them have it, right? Yeah, give it an extra 24 hours. And well, and just that's, Some that's something too that we always have to kind of make sure we explain. Um, going into the title company, that week of closing, usually you sign papers a couple days before closing. Sometimes it's the afternoon before or the day of. That's kind of rare, but it does happen. Um, signing the papers, I've had, I somehow, no matter how much I say it, almost every time the buyers say, okay, you're meeting me with the keys right then, right? The title company's going to give me keys. No, they're not going to give you keys. You're going to sign your life away <laughs> happily, and you're going to bring your check for your closing costs, your final down payments. Yeah. And then the title company is going to finish their paperwork, review and make sure they haven't missed any signatures on both sides. Yeah. And lender, then they're going to send it all to the, the lender's going to match the paperwork. They're all going to review their things. Yep. Lender's going to send the money to the title company. Title company sends the paperwork to the county office. County office sits on it for a couple of hours and then stamps it. <laughs> Right. We all know government paperwork always takes a minute. Yeah. Usually if it's sent over in the morning, we've got stamps by the afternoon. Title company has the stamped paperwork saying you're you're clear. You officially own a house. Yeah. So yeah. if we right. if we get all the signatures and the paperwork done by 10 or 11 in the morning, we can usually close by two or three in the afternoon and hand you keys. 
if it's an afternoon signing or stamping, it's going to be the next day. Oh. So don't be expecting, you know, don't have your truck ready to empty it back out at the new house at, at noon. That's not going to happen. Right. Not going to happen. And and when you do get your keys, that's when uh, Michelle and I want to record a video uh, of you getting your keys and, and doing a happy dance or whatever you do. And uh, <laughs> so you can share it with your friends and family, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and we can share it in your joy. Because it is pretty awesome to have Alice. I know for me, when I went from renting to owning my first house, my quality of life, I, I really, it's hard to even comprehend or, or, or give a quantitative assessment of how much, you know, my, my life improved. But it, it was easily 10 times better. Yeah, <laughs> easily 10 times better. So uh, I guess that's maybe speaks to a question that would, should I even buy a house? Like, uh, if you value your, your quality of life, Yes, <laughs> for yeah. sure. Yeah. And now, if you're living in uh, a penthouse suite and you'll enjoy that kind of lifestyle, <laughs> then maybe not. But, you know, if you're renting in kind of a regular apartment, yeah, probably should do it. Plus, it might be worth it. Yeah. And right yeah. now, honestly, the payment's about the same. So, yeah, right. <laughs> Good point. And there's no equity potential in renting. So, right. there's, right. you know, you have the rent buy down, you have your mortgage buy down. So you're it's like a forced savings plan every month. You get tax a tax break, right? And generally speaking, real estate, you have appreciation. If you look at what all the hedge funds are doing, they're buying real estate. Will the market go down a little bit? It might. It might. It very well might. Um, you know, of course, that's probably a whole nother long discussion. And Michelle maybe have a different opinion than I do. And she's maybe in a bubble too. Uh, tri cities is a little different than a lot of the rest of the country. Um, but you know, things can settle down for a while. Um, you know, I remember my folks had owned a house in, in Southern California and real estate prices kind of, you know, generally did this, but they generally went up, you know, so if you held it for five years, you're probably going to be okay, you know, and, uh, Tri-City seems to have been that way. Um, down a thousand and up three, down a thousand and up yeah, three. Yeah, something like that. It's like, oh, wow, I lost a thousand bucks. Okay, just wait a few months, you know, yeah. <laughs> It's not not that big a deal. So, but yeah, the quality of life is a huge, huge thing too. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I, we're, we've gone about an hour and I think we covered a lot of good ground. I, I, I think it was helpful. Hopefully those people found it helpful. And if um, if there's anybody in Ohio that uh, wants some help in North, North Central Ohio, you know, pretty much anywhere from eh, Willoughby to Sandusky down to Ashland and Akron, uh, yeah, maybe a little further here and there. If, if you're really nice, uh, then I'm happy to help you. <laughs> I do uh, residential and some commercial. Uh, I've sold warehouses and uh, an airplane hangar. Help look, help somebody look for a Bitcoin mining operation uh, in Tri Cities, actually. And we never did quite find what we were looking for. They, they need they need certain things, and uh, not easy to find. But it was interesting. I, I learned a lot from that. And um, sold an airplane hangar, uh, working ranch, uh, a lot of new construction, uh, and uh, of course, lots of resales, lots of land. I'm actually a, a land um, uh, coach within uh, within a group that I'm in, and uh, so it kind of covers a little bit of new construction too. And then, uh, and then Michelle, uh, you obviously like first time home buyers, right? Yep, I do a lot of first time home buyers. I lot I do a lot of um, retiring and VA home buyers also. Those are kind of my three little targets there. Nice. Um, yeah, nice. a lot of residential, and I dabble in the commercial here and there too. And I, I you like the, right? it, it sounds yeah. like from our last conversation, you, you prefer writing leases like for doctors' offices and things like that when it comes to commercial, huh? Um. I, I don't, but it's so funny, you know, if you, if you put out there, this is what I like to do. That's not what you get to do. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love doing the contracts, the sales, and it's just nice and straight forward. The leases are a little messier, um, but I've just, I've somehow accidentally been more successful with that. So yes. it is just yeah. who my people are and who comes to me. So, yeah, yeah. And how good, how clear are they and what they want to, right? Right, right. And that, yep, I've done a couple doctor leases just because I have a great doctor friend and she knew exactly what she wanted and she even found the space and just said, write my papers. So nice. that makes it, I love that. I love that. I love, yeah. it's so funny because I, I love the clients that know exactly what they want and it makes it nice and smooth. But I also really like the clients that don't have a clue what they want. Yeah. Because I can kind of help them 
find it. Yeah, they're willing to be guided and yeah, and listen carefully to what you have to say because yeah. well, you know a thing or two. That discovery process is kind of fun. Yeah, and I think the thing is too, like, I I think it's this way for Michelle too. Like, I try to put myself in my buyer's shoes and really kind of sort of get under their skin in a sense that you know really try to have their best uh, you know their best interest at heart mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, it takes a little connection, takes a little talking, a little discussion, and may take showing a couple of properties too to really to oh, get yeah. that, you know. Um, and I think we both have so much experience, both with just homes we've lived in, the thirty-two homes I've lived in, and and the homes that we've shown. You know, we've shown probably thousands of houses. Yeah. And I have some clients that have seen a hundred or more just because they just couldn't find the one, um, but. I think sometimes when a buyer comes to us, especially a new buyer, first time buyer, and they come to us and they're, you know, I just need those three bedrooms. Hmm. And maybe they don't, they don't see the long term or even the somewhat short term of, okay, this house has three bedrooms and it looks amazing and it's in great, perfect condition, but you have a newborn and all the secondary bedrooms are downstairs at the other end of the house. Do you want to go back and forth through the house at 2 a.m.? Probably not. You know, that may be a great fit for someone with teenagers that doesn't want the drum set and the video games next to their master bedroom, but it's probably not the greatest for the ones with toddlers or infants that need a little more one-on-one. -on -one. So sometimes it's not just three bedrooms, two baths. It's not just that quick checklist. It's really looking at the, the home and how it will be used, how you need to use your home. Right, right. That's good. That's good. Well, very good. Well, I think we should tie it up with a ribbon right here, Michelle, or <laughs> Lander Plain, as they say on Clubhouse. And uh, I thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do little kind of, uh, you know, buyer consult interviews, sort of, you know, what, what should I know if I'm wanting to buy a house for the first time? And I think it was a lot of fun. And hopefully uh, our viewers will get a lot of use out of it. <music>